Well, our reading today from Matthew's Gospel is Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. Uh, You can find that in the service sheets if you've printed them off. Uh, You can have it there on the screen, or you can look it up in your own Bibles at home. Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 22. When Jesus saw large crowds around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Lord, another of his disciples said, First let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an opportunity uh, to follow along on the outline, uh, either there on the screen or uh, on your service sheets if you print them off. Uh, The purpose of the outline is so you can jot down notes if you have any questions. And there were some some terrific questions that came through last week after the sermon about the miracles. If you have any questions, any feedback, any comments, any needs, Uh, please use the comment box at the bottom of the service and Neil or I will endeavour to respond as quickly as we can uh, in either answering your questions or giving you a hand. Uh, Jesus has the authority to teach. Jesus has the authority to heal. I'm at point one on the outline. He has the authority to deal with the whole package of sin and the brokenness that it brings. But how far does this authority of Jesus reach? Does Jesus have the authority to define what it means to follow him? That's an important question because it affects people like us, people who call ourselves followers of Jesus. Uh, It affects people like us because we like Jesus' teaching and its authority, his wise take on life, the way he insightfully skewers the proud and the religious, the self-righteous and the pompous. It affects people like us because We love the way in which Jesus' authority in action deals with the downtrodden, the outcast, the sick and the broken. We love Jesus as the teacher. We love Jesus as the saviour. But do we accept Jesus as the Lord? Does Jesus have the authority to tell me what it means to follow him? What it means to to follow him wherever he goes. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Uh, Only five verses we're looking at today, uh, but there is an insightful sharpness here which aims to show us what it means for Jesus to have authority over our lives. Father, help us to listen, to understand, to repent, to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Now, Matthew's written this biography so that we can meet Jesus as he truly is. Our first, Jesus fulfills God's promise to deal with the broken state of the world, to deal with sin through the family of Abraham. Jesus is the king promised by God who would restore all things to blessing from curse. Second, as Jesus deals with sin, he's about bringing in God's kingdom. He's focused on bringing sinners, uh, all humans, because all humans have the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not, back to God, back to living with God in his rightful place. Third, for those who are from Abraham's family, the nation of Israel, the, the people from which Matthew has been drawn from, this is a moment they'd always waited for the moment when the promises of God, which had seemed so distant and desolate and bedraggled, the day when those promises would be fulfilled. For those outside Israel, outside Abraham's family, people like me and perhaps like you, this is a moment when they see that God is committed to dealing with sin, with the sin of us, with the sin of all people from any tribe and nation and tongue. And fourth, as Matthew portrays Jesus, He makes sure that we know him, especially in this part, as the man with authority. 
He has authority as a teacher, someone who speaks clearly of and from and about God's word. He has authority as a healer, a miracle worker, someone who exercises that authority in his daily life as he sets the world aright as part of his ultimate work of dealing with human sin. Oh, whether it's because of his authority as a teacher or his authority as a miracle worker, wherever he goes, Jesus attracts a large crowd. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, as he taught his closest followers on the mountain in Matthew chapters 5 to 7, a large crowd gathered around and was amazed at his teaching. As he descended the mountain and moved to his base of Capernaum, a large crowd follows again, Matthew chapter 8 verses 1 and 16. As he continues his work, he sees a large crowd gathering around him. Look at verse 18. When Jesus saw large crowds around him, he gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. Well, the large crowd is a constant source of temptation and distraction for Jesus. Numerous points across all four biographies, all four gospels of Jesus. He dismisses the crowd. He escapes the crowd. He even retreats from the crowd into the wilderness, often to pray. His amazing authority as a teacher and a worker of miracles would have galvanized the Jewish hopes, raised their expectation, given them dreams for a nation that had been oppressed and dispossessed with promises from God that seemed distant. It wouldn't have taken much to raise nationalistic fervor, and it would take a lot to dampen it, maybe even dispel it. Moreover, just as he was at the start of his public ministry, Jesus himself, I suspect, would have been tempted to express his identity in alternative ways. Remember there at the start of his public ministry, when the devil comes to him in the wilderness and says, if you are the son of, well, that temptation stays with Jesus. The temptation to express himself in a way that would not have accorded with God's plans and promises. So he gives the order. Did you see that there in verse 18? He gave the order to go over to another region, presumably uh, across the lake, the sea. That's a statement of authority, isn't it? It's reminiscent of that interchange he had with the centurion in verses 5 to 13. It establishes again that Jesus is a man of authority, this time as he deals with those following him. And there's a distinction drawn here, isn't there? The distinction between the large crowd, which seems to want to define Jesus and follow him in ways that please themselves, and then Jesus himself and those who are his true followers. Just as much as seems to have been in the previous section, the three miracles, and then in the section on the Sermon on the Mount, these few verses, these five verses, seem to be about Jesus' authority and what it looks like. As Jesus and his followers prepare to move away, someone approaches them. Look there in verse 19. A scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The man's a scribe. He's a religious lawyer. He's a man who is deadly serious about honouring God by knowing and obeying God's revealed word. His greeting is certainly sincere and respectful. His statement is one that seems on face value to be of wholehearted commitment. But I suspect all is not as it seems. This man speaks in a way that actually makes himself the focus. To put it simply, this man is confident that I can follow you wherever you go. His confidence, his security is in I. Now, one commentator says that the man seems to be saying in public, hey, Jesus, this is your lucky day. I am going to follow you. Well, that makes sense of Jesus' response because it's certainly sharp, isn't it? After all, if the man had been serious and wholehearted, perhaps, if I dare say it, if the man had been genuine in his desire, why does Jesus respond this way? His response focuses in on the key symbol that humans have in their lives for security, the home, the place where everyone invests their security, where we go to have rest. 
in nature. Foxes have a den, they have a home. Birds have a nest, they have a home. But the Son of Man, Jesus, he has no such security. And by implication, those who are going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly will be confronted by the question of where their own security lies. Does their security lie in themselves and their abilities like the scribe? Does their security lie in their plans and their possessions, their aspirations, all tied in to that building that they turn to for security? By consequence, if you're going to follow Jesus, he seems to be saying, your security must be in Jesus and nothing else. To follow Jesus is to be stripped of all security that lies outside him. Well, someone else approaches Jesus. Look at verse 21. Lord, another of his disciples said, first, let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me. Let the dead bury their own dead. The person is identified as a disciple. They seem uh, in the social circles to be closer in towards Jesus. This st- statement's a little ambiguous. Their father could be elderly and nearing his end, and so they need to go home and care for him in his latter years, or perhaps their father has died, and they need to leave immediately and bury him in the next few hours, as was Jewish custom. In either case, the listeners around Jesus would have understood the responsibility to deal in such a way with your father trumped all other responsibilities within Jewish society. However, the key to understanding this disciple's statement is not so much in what he desires to do, but that it is his first desire. Did you see that in verse 21? First, let me go bury my father. It's almost as if he's saying to Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I want to follow you. I will follow you. There are just some things that need to be done first, some perfectly reasonable and sensible, good and respectable things that need to be done first. Then I'll follow you. The issue is actually highlighted by a clever play on words. As Jesus has commanded his followers in verse 18 to go over to another place, this man uses the same word to say first he has to go and bury his father. The contrast is unavoidable. And Jesus' response is clear and concise. It consists of two commands, follow, leave. Couldn't be clearer, could it? Jesus seems to be making clear that those who follow him must follow him, have their priorities set by him. Jesus defines what it means to follow him. Jesus defines the priorities of his followers. Jesus says, follow, leave. In that sense, he seems to be saying, those who follow Jesus have the priority of life. Leave the dead with those who are dead those who are not following Jesus. In essence, Jesus' response focuses on the issue of priority and priorities. It's an issue raised by the would-be follower, isn't it? Here's some other things that need to be focused on first and then Jesus (coughs) can be followed. Here's some other things that have an equal priority to Jesus even more and then Jesus can be followed. Jesus' response is emphatic. No, a follower of Jesus has the priorities of Jesus. A follower of Jesus has their priorities set by Jesus. Jesus is moving away from the crowd. He gives an order to go elsewhere to his followers. A scribe approaches proclaiming his security in his ability to follow Jesus and Jesus confronts him with where his security lies. A disciple approaches, stating his desire to follow Jesus after he has done other things. Jesus confronts him about his priorities. Matthew is making very clear that Jesus has the authority to define what it means to follow him. Let me say that again. Matthew is making very clear that Jesus has the authority 
to define what it means to follow him. As the crowd swirls, as followers approach with security wrongly placed and with (coughs) priorities misestablished, Jesus states very clearly, I have the authority to define your following. Put simply, if Jesus has the authority to teach, if Jesus has the authority to save, then Jesus has the authority to be Lord. Put personally, if you are going to accept Jesus' authority as the teacher and if you are going to receive his gift as the saviour, then you must submit to him as your Lord. Let me finish by drawing out some conclusions. I'm at point four on the outline and you'll see that I want to make a number of observations. Now, observation one, if Jesus has the authority to teach and to save, he has the authority to be Lord. Remember we started with that question of how far does Jesus' authority extend? Well, he certainly has the authority to teach, doesn't he? He certainly has the authority to save through healing and dealing with sin. We saw that last week. That must mean that he has the authority over those who follow him. Put another way, Jesus is Lord and Saviour. Jesus is Saviour and Lord. This is so important for us to grasp if we say that we trust in Jesus. And we can't have him as our teacher. We can't have him as our saviour and then draw the line and say, you can't be my Lord. I don't want you as my boss. The authority that he has as the teacher and the saviour means that he has the authority to be the Lord of the lives of his followers, of God's people. I suspect that's why Matthew has constructed this section like this. We have the picture of Jesus as a teacher, Matthew 5 to 7. The picture of Jesus as a saviour, Matthew 8, 1 to 17. The miracles over nature and demons and sin for the benefit of people in Matthew 8, 23 to 9, 8. And then in the middle, these five verses, which draw the implications of that authority for what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus defines it. Jesus is Lord. He defines what it means to follow him. Observation two, what Jesus is not saying. It's very important at this point to be careful about how we hear what Jesus is saying. We can't play statements off against each other, especially against the rest of the Bible, creating contradictions where Jesus sees none. The natural outcome of doing that would be, well, will I decide what to hear and apply? It means Jesus isn't Lord. I'm effectively Lord. We'll come to that in a moment in the fourth observation. Moreover, we mustn't see these words as limited by their culture or historical circumstances. We'll come to that in the third observation. We mustn't see Jesus creating a guilt ethic or a debt economy here. He is not saying, look at how much I've done for you. What are you going to give up for me? Jesus is not saying, look at how much I've done for you. How can you repay this debt you now have? God doesn't work that way. That's not the economy of grace and mercy where the Son of God comes to bring the outsiders in. Observation three, the historical present. Now, I'm wary about this point. Uh, You don't often want to turn to Greek to make a point. It just makes you sound arrogant and elitist. But there are times when something so stands out in the text that you think, I've got to draw attention to that because Matthew's drawing attention to that. As Matthew records Jesus' response, Matthew uses verbs in the present tense. They're in verse 20 and they're in verse 21. Jesus says, Jesus says. It makes Jesus' response stand out against the rest of the passage where everything is in the past, where people said, people did. People followed. The effect is striking. What Jesus said is brought to the forefront of the whole passage. It makes it current whenever you read it because it's always in the present tense to stretch the image. In this sense, I think Matthew is saying, 
whatever your culture, whatever your history, wherever you are, whoever you are, Jesus says. Jesus says. Observation four. Jesus defines security and priority for his followers. I don't think Jesus is establishing a series of contradictions for his followers to puzzle through. For example, I don't think he's not encouraging wisdom, making wise decisions in a broken world to be played off against being devoted to Jesus. And you can't have a house. I don't think he's playing honour your father and mother off against honouring Jesus. Jesus is not in the game of creating internal contradictions within the word of God. What he is doing is emphasising in practical terms something that he's already taught. Listen again to Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 to 34. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus described following him as being brought into citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, of being connected to Jesus, which made God your father. In that sense, the followers of Jesus have God as their father and his kingdom, his design, his way of life as their priority. And they come into that by being connected to Jesus They have security because they are connected to Jesus, which gives them a relationship with an eternal father and gives them a focus on God's kingdom. For a follower of Jesus, this means that there is not a list of priorities that needs to be followed, kind of unrolled in every circumstance. You know, God first, spouse second, family third, blah, blah, blah. There's not an acronym either. Jesus, others, yourself. Jesus simplifies it to one very simple priority. I am your Lord. What does that look like? In this, and this, and this. That's a statement of security. As Jesus made clear in Matthew 6, those who call God Father because they're connected to Jesus will have all they need to be his people. They're secure. It's a statement of priority. As Jesus makes clear in Matthew 6, to be connected to Jesus is to have God as Father, Jesus as Lord, and citizenship in a kingdom above any other kingdom with one priority in every part of life. In essence, that means that Jesus defines all of our security and all of our priorities from our desires, from our leisure time, to the job that we seek and what it means through to our priorities for our marriages and our children, into the way we spend money and time, through to the houses that we idolise, to the interactions we have with families and weekends and governments. Observation five. Jesus as Lord will put you at odds with the world. To be blunt, this security and priority which is in Jesus alone will put you at odds with the whole world. To have Jesus as Lord means you are not, which means that you're at odds with the rest of the world. Let me give you four areas out of all the areas in our lives that this will provoke some question and conflict with the world, perhaps even more so in the current pandemic environment. First, how is Jesus Lord of your career and time management and possessions. Albert Schweitzer says, Jesus was devoid of all middle-class security, and so too must his followers be. That will radically rework your understanding of employment, the way in which you take rest, the kind of jobs you apply for, the way in which your career runs your life, or vice versa, the decisions that go with that, even how you view your house and its place in your life. Second, how is Jesus Lord of your family? If Jesus and his kingdom is your security and priority, how does this define following him in your marriage? 
in your family life, in the way your household runs, the way in which you view them and your place in them, the way in which that household is structured. Third, how is Jesus Lord of your parenting? If Jesus and his kingdom is your security and priority, how does this define the decisions you make as a parent in the dreams you have for your children, in what you pray for your family, in what your children understand from you about Jesus being Lord and the decisions you make for the family and the time it has? Fourth, how is Jesus Lord of your leisure? If Jesus and his kingdom is your security and priority, how does this define the decisions you make in regard to your leisure pursuits, the way in which rest and family and children and leisure interact, the way in which leisure impacts your marriage and your family life, the way in which leisure impacts your relationships in the community? Observation six. Well, it's not really an observation It's really just an attempt to summarise what we've learnt today. You cannot have Jesus' radical teaching and his radical salvation without having his authority to radically redefine you because he is your Lord. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for these five verses. Father, there are so many levels here and so many ways in which your word speaks to us, but please apply it to our lives by helping us to know that Jesus is our Lord, that if we come under his radical teaching, if we accept the radical grace of his salvation, we are to submit to his leadership as Lord, which will radically redefine us. We pray that you'll do this in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.